morning, welcome. Please join me in the greeting. In our disagreements and conflicts, may we seek the face of Christ. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. When we face division, may we remember our shared mission. Lord, unite us in your purpose. In moments of anger and frustration, may we extend grace to one another. Lord, help us in your love and compassion. Let us not be divided by secondary issues, but united in our devotion to Christ. Lord, make us one in your spirit. May our unity be a witness to the world of your love and truth. Lord, be the head of our church and our lives. Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together as we recite the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the opening prayer. Pray with me. Almighty God, thank you for working all things together for our good. You are faithful, even during our conflicts and struggles. You never stop loving us, even when we seem unlovable. When humans seek to divide, you multiply through your grace and mercy. God, you are so good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we bow for a time of silent prayer, please continue to remember the family of Dick Beer, who went on to life triumphant last week. Services will be here at Anderson Hills this Wednesday at 1 p.m. May we pray. Good morning, Father. Thank you for the blessing of a new day. Thank you for gathering your children to worship. May you be the sole focus of our attention and adoration this morning. We are here to give you all glory and praise. Thank you for loving us and not only allowing but inviting us into your holy presence. We are amazed at your goodness and your might. 
Lord, we lift up so many today, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, those who've suffered loss in the wake of the hurricane, those facing devastating flooding here and abroad, for all those who remain in war-torn areas. We pray for our nation as contentions divide our brothers and sisters. The scriptures teach us that division and conflict are as old as mankind and that even your apostles were not immune. So Father, we ask that all across our world, you would bless the peacemakers, bless those who extend mercy and grace, bless those who sow unity in love and compassion. Unite us to remember our calling to be on mission sharing the gospel and may you bless the feet of those who carry your good news. Because you have first loved us, because you allowed your son to be broken and to die for us, may we be the light that you've called us to be. Unify us, Holy Lord, and may the prayer you modeled for us take root as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, welcome once again to those present in our sanctuary and those who are also watching via our live stream. If you're a guest, we ask that you please fill out a connect card in your row and drop it in the offering plate as it's passed. Please pass the pew pads to get to know those around you and register your attendance via the QR code in your program or you may check in online. Well, we've all seen the devastation this week from Hurricane Helene, and we partner with Matthew 25 Ministries here in Cincinnati. Check out our events page on our website to give or to donate supplies. We have a serve opportunity coming up in a few weeks, and we'd like to see everyone participating somewhere October 13th through the 19th. Look for Serve Week on the events page and pick out the serve that's right for you. More than 40 couples are going to the Anderson Hills Marriage Retreat at the end of October, and registration is still open on our events page. At this time, we invite our ushers to come forward, and we remind you it is your generosity that helps fund so many of these ministries here at our church and beyond their walls. You can give your tithes and offerings anytime, online and in person.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Well, good morning, church. So good to be with you all today. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Anderson Hills. And uh, we are, uh, well, actually, before I jump into the message today, um, we, I want to tell you about our next message series that's coming up. Um, it's called Rise Up, and it's starting on October 6th. Am I on here? Am I okay? No? Yes, I am. Okay, I am. Great. Sorry. My ear is not always the best, so I want to make sure. Um, but, um, our next series coming up called Rise Up uh, will be starting next weekend. I believe you have the Bible reading plan about that. Um, th- I think this is a really important message series, one of the most important in our church's recent history. Um, we talked to you back in January about some vision that we have um, to be more and more effective at how we reach families with kids and teens. It's not to say that's the only thing that matters to us, but something we want to put an especially big focus on as a church. And uh, as, a, as part of that, we're going to be launching a comprehensive campaign uh, where I'm going to invite you to give generously uh, to help make this all possible. We're coming around to the life groups to uh, tell more about this. Uh, if you're not in a life group or you can't make it to your life group's meeting, um, we will be uh, having a couple of general sessions. You see on the screen there on October 10th and October 13th. I want to invite you to join us for one of those. Um, so today we are wrapping up the message series called United, and we're going to look at a story straight from the early church when two of the New Testament heroes had a dispute. And on the surface, it wasn't great. (laughs) This is not one of those that like, oh, it all just ended wonderfully. Like, honestly, we don't even know fully how it ended. Uh, We infer some things from the scripture, but I think that there's a lot we can learn in how they had this dispute that is actually very relevant to us today. You know, the early church was an incredible place where the Holy Spirit was on the move in a powerful way. God was changing lives. People were coming to him. But there were still challenges. There were still disagreements. There were still problems. As long as a church has people, it has problems because none of us are perfect. Acts chapter 15, verse 36, tells the story here uh, between Paul and Barnabas and their disagreement. So Paul, at, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Okay, so they had taken a mission trip before, gone all around kind of the known world, and had shared the good news, planted churches, and, they, and Paul says, hey, let's go back and check in on them. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. So Barnabas, to give you a little background on him, Barnabas is a key church leader uh, who uh, he is someone who comes to our attention in the book of Acts, chapter 4, so really early in the story. In fact, um, Barnabas predates Paul as one of the leaders in the church. Listen to the story about him. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. That's a long intro right there just to what his name is. He sold a field, and he brought the money and placed it at the disciple or the apostles' feet. Okay, so this guy... Barnabas, if you will. His real name is Joseph, a great Israelite name, uh, named after the uh, guy with the coat of many colors from Genesis. Uh, he had, he was a Levite, so he was of the priestly family, the priestly tribe. He didn't live in Israel, he lived in Cyprus, but here's what he was known for. He was known for his encouragement. In fact, so much, they stopped calling him Joseph and they started calling him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Most names then meant son of something that was standard for guys. So they basically, they're naming him for encouraging. They're like, you are so encouraging. We're just going to call you Mr. Encouragement, you know. It's pretty impressive right there. And so, uh, they, so they do this, and, they, and he also is a generous man. He gives generously. Um, he sees a need, so he sells a field, and he gives the money to the apostles uh, to be used um, to help those in need. So, so he's a great guy. I mean, how could you possibly not like Barnabas? He's encouraging. He's generous. He's, he's just a good guy. 
now, Saul, on the other hand, Saul had a, a different background. His name was first Saul, then Paul. Um, also someone who would have been a high-ranking Israelite. His name, of course, named for the first king of Israel. And Saul was someone who was a Pharisee. He was, in fact, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a great Pharisee, and he was very passionate about his Jewish faith, so much that he saw Jesus as being in conflict. He didn't understand Jesus as the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. He was misunderstanding. He was seeing him as in conflict with it. So Saul began actually persecuting the church. He was going around even having Christians killed. So Saul was very, very serious about this. He was intensely focused on this until one day he's on his way to Damascus and Jesus meets him there. Jesus has already ascended into heaven, but he appears before Saul, knocks him off his horse. He's blinded by all of this. And Jesus confronts him, says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was like the church was taking the hit, but Saul was really fighting against Jesus. Well, Saul would be blinded. Uh, He would be, uh, some early Christians would go and would pray there for him and would be there for him. And one of them was Barnabas. And Barnabas vouched for Saul. He, He said, you know, we should trust this guy, which was crazy, right? Again, he had just been killing Christians. So needless to say, he failed the background check, right? <laughs> this guy, he should not qualify as a church leader. But, but he, they forgive him, and, and they pray for him, and he rest, his sight is restored. And, and Saul, his name is changed to Paul eventually, and he becomes a, a model of what spreading the gospel is all about. He's like the leading evangelist for the early church, going all around the, the ancient world and spreading the good news. Paul was someone who was very focused, very intentional. The mission mattered so much to him that uh, he could not be taken off of it. I mean, he got shipwrecked, he got arrested, he got beaten, all these things. They wouldn't slow Saul down. He believed so much in the mission and so much in the gospel. He just wanted to share it with everybody. So Barnabas was one of the key people in helping Saul to become part of the church and getting his ministry started. In fact, some scholars say that Paul may never have been welcomed into the church if it weren't for Barnabas. So these two go way back. So they had taken their first ministry uh, missionary journey. They traveled extensively together, very successful, planted all these churches. Paul says, all right, let's go back. Let's do this. Well, They had previously taken a guy named John, sometimes known as Mark. Um, We call him John Mark, as it does here in Acts. And John Mark was a young man who went with them and traveled, and he was uh, part of the team. And for some reason, we don't know why, for some reason, John Mark, it says, had not continued with them in their work. So at, at some point in the trip, they, uh, John Mark kind of ditches them. He leaves them behind. I don't know why. I don't know if he didn't like the cooking. I don't know if he missed mom. I don't know what his deal was. But for some reason, John Mark heads on out. He leaves them. Now, to Paul, imagine how much this must have been frustrating and maybe even hurtful. I mean, Paul is all in on the mission. This guy can't be stopped by a shipwreck or prison or beatings, and John Mark just wants to walk away. He, he, he's a quitter. How, like, how can we trust this guy? You know, like he, he ditches us, right? Well, Barnabas, there's a couple things about him. One, I told you he was an encourager. But two, John Mark was actually Barnabas' cousin. So he probably had a special place in, in uh, Barnabas' heart. So when they're going to take this next mission trip— Barnabas is like, hey, why don't we take John Mark along? I mean, hear me out on this. He, yeah, I know, I know, he, he did kind of let us down, but we should give him some grace. We should give him another chance. You know, we, we, should, we should let him do this. He needs some encouragement in his life. Let's just, let's have him come with us. Paul doesn't see, this, see it this way at all. He's not having any of this. He's like, no, John Mark ditched us. We don't have time for this stuff. We're out on mission. This is important. I don't have time for this guy's drama, okay? I just want to go do my job. We'll just leave him behind. Let him do his thing here. And they disagree. The Bible says it is a sharp disagreement. 
in, in the original language, that's a very, it's a heavy word, and it implies a deeply felt irritation and anger. Okay, so this isn't just like a, ah, maybe you should go, maybe not. Like they were each very entrenched in their position. They each strongly believed that they were right. The other person was wrong about this. So much that when it was time to leave, they each decided to go their own ways. Paul picked up a new partner in Silas, and Barnabas takes John Mark. And they each go out and they do their mission work together. I, I mean, with side by, uh, not, not, the, not Paul and Barnabas together, um, Paul and Silas together. So what do we do with this? I mean, we like to have stories kind of with a neat little ending, and this one, they just, they kind of go their own ways. You know, I think we can learn from this. For one, it teaches us that the early church had its problems as well. We can put aside any notion that the early church was this, like, Pollyanna, perfect place, and no problems. Like, no, there, there were problems and challenges. In fact, as long as there's people, there will be challenges, right? Because we all sin, we all mess up. Billy Graham famously said that if you find the perfect church, don't join it, you'd spoil it. <laughs> True. Or if they're looking for a pastor, don't become the pastor because we'll spoil it, right? We're, we're all people, me, you, all of us here. We all sin, we all mess up, or sometimes it's not even sin. Sometimes we just are gonna disagree. Sometimes we're not gonna see eye to eye on everything. That's part of life, it's part of being a person, part of being a church. Every church goes through this in times. Um, all, all people go through this in time. But what can we learn from this story beyond the fact that Christians will disagree? Well, we aren't given a lot of details, um, but we can infer some things from what happens later. Um, we don't hear a lot about Barnabas's mission trip, which doesn't mean it was a failure. Probably means more so that Luke, the writer of Acts, was more connected uh, with, with Paul and his people than with Barnabas. That's kind of the assumption, um, because there's certainly in church history there's fruit from that trip that, that Barnabas took with John Mark. So God did use them. We know that. Um, but what about Paul? What about, what about his feelings towards Barnabas and John Mark? Well, in his other letters, like 2 Timothy, he speaks very highly of, of Barnabas and uh, John Mark. He speaks highly of both of them. He refers to John Mark as, as a valued colleague in ministry. So it's clear that Paul doesn't hold in some kind of like long-term hostility, anything like that. They just had a disagreement, and they realized that the best way was for the forward was for them to each take a trip, to go their own separate ways in this. Also, there's no evidence that the early church was split over this conflict. There doesn't become any Church of Paul and Church of Barnabas, no. It doesn't seem that they let this spill out into the greater church. This was a disagreement between these two leaders that led to them each taking a separate trip. So I want to suggest three lessons on unity that come from this story, because I think there's a lot to learn here. I think, really, they summarize this whole series. Number one, how you disagree with other Christians matters. How you disagree with other Christians matters. The assumption is you will disagree at times. We'll, we'll do this. We will disagree at times. It's part of being, being human beings. There, and there are tons of issues that are not black and white in the Bible. Now, there are many that are, don't get me wrong, but there are many things, like this is a clear one from Paul, you know, that Paul and Barnabas. There's not any clear-cut biblical um, uh, direction you know, you could certainly argue for, for grace and forgiveness, but you could certainly argue for the importance of the mission and that John Mark may have compromised that. So, so you could argue this both ways, biblically. You could tell stories from the Bible that could support either side here, right? Um, so how you disagree matters when we're talking about those kinds of things. Now, there are big issues where Scripture is clear, and when Scripture is clear, it gives directives, we must follow that. I'm not here to be an editor of the Bible. That's not my place. I'm here to communicate God's Word. So if, for example, if one person wants to lie or cheat 
or steal, or something like this. Uh, it's fine. It's important to say, no, that's, that's not how we act as Christians. This is not a let's agree to disagree matter. No, this is something where the Bible is really clear. So we as Christians, we follow that. We go that way. We don't justify that which the Bible condemns. But, but there's going to be many times where we don't have that same clarity. In this situation, who is right? Who's right? Is Paul right? Is, is Barnabas right? Well, the Bible doesn't really tell us, but, but we could solve it here today. Okay, why don't we take a vote here? We'll figure this out, all right? So let's say it for you. Um, I'm going to have you do a show of hands in a moment. How many of you are on Team Paul? You would say, you know, the mission is so important. You just can't risk taking around, along someone who's proven not to be trustworthy. He's proven that he's not reliable. He had a job. He didn't do it. So, you know, nothing against John Mark, but he should stay home. How many of you would be on Paul's side? Okay, yep, we've got a few of you there. Yep, excellent. How many of you are like, no, John Mark, he needs some encouragement. He just needs some support. support. He's, he's a young guy. Just needs, he needs a second shot. Let's take him along. How many of you are there with Barnabas? Okay, looks like we got more Barnabas, folks. But some of you didn't vote, though. <laughs> and I know what you're doing. You're like, no, I'm not voting for them. I'm voting for Jesus. <laughs> he wasn't on the ballot, okay? You wasted your chance. Paul needed more votes, and you let him down. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> just kidding. Look, it, it's, Christians could disagree on this, right? We can make a very good case for either one. And, and probably more of us are in favor of Barnabas because we know that it worked out well, right? If John Mark would have gone along and train wrecked the trip, and the Bible tells us about that, we'd be like, yeah, no, should have left him at home, right? So, so this is kind of where, where it is. It's one of those issues that could be debated. But we do know, we do know the fruit that God worked through them because of how they handled it. They didn't burn the church down over this. They didn't demand that we make two camps like I just did and make you vote. They didn't do that. They didn't divide their congregation over this issue, right? Instead, they chose just to move forward. We're going to take a trip, Barnabas and John Mark. We're going to take a trip, Paul and Silas. We're going to go forward, and we're going to do that. And look at what God did. God turned their division into multiplication. God used this to build the kingdom even bigger. I have to think that two mission trips brought about more fruit than one mission trip. That's kind of elementary math here, right? I'm pretty sure that would have been the case. God took their division and used it to multiply. How you disagree matters. If Paul and Barnabas would have let this bleed out into the greater church, if Paul and Barnabas would have turned this into a lot of gossip or nastiness or meanness, if Paul would have written bad things about Barnabas later in his letters, imagine the dis divisiveness that would have come. How you disagree matters. How you end things matters. Think about um, maybe you've left a job before. Would Jesus be pleased with how you left that job? I, I say this to church staff routinely, that you can tell more about a church staff member's character by the way that they leave something than the way that they do something. Because when you don't have that influence or that position or compensation or whatever anymore, when you're leaving it, you're showing exactly what your character is like. It's one of the things I'm so thankful for at Anderson Hills. We have such great history of this. Uh, and this isn't a perfect example because I know we're talking about conflict, but um, I remember when my predecessor, Pastor Mark, retired, it wasn't at all a conflict. It was that he was ready to retire. He'd done a great job, served this place faithfully for 18 years. And, and Mark retired, um, and of course he and, his, and uh, Melinda, they're still part of this church. And I remember when I was coming here to be your new pastor, some of my pastor friends heard about that, that Pastor Mark was going to stay at the church, and they're like, aren't you worried about this? Like, this could go very badly, because in history it has gone badly in many circumstances like this. But if you know our story here, you know that's exactly the opposite. That Pastor Mark, I'm so glad that he and Melinda are at this church. They are a huge blessing to us. They are a gift. Mark modeled what it is to do healthy transition. And I remember saying to my friends, I'm not a bit wor worried, and here's why. I know Mark. I know his character. I know who he is as a follower of Jesus. So no, 
I'm not worried. I'm not worried because I know he has the character to end something well. He's one example of many who've done that so well here at Anderson Hills. The way you leave a job, the way you end an argument, the way you uh, move out if you have to move out from a set of roommates, the way that you uh, break up with a girlfriend or boyfriend, the way that you, whatever it is, the way that you end a business agreement. These are all ways that we demonstrate who we are in the Lord. Do you, when you're doing this, when you're ending something, is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Do, you, do people see you as a person of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Are these things shown in the way that you end something? Or are you just a wrecking ball in the way that you end? Are you just damaging things, burning it down on the way out the door? That's not of the Lord, friends. That's not of the Lord. Let us be a people with better character than that. God turned their division into multiplication because they left well. Here's a second lesson. Two, keep your eye on the mission. Keep your eye on the mission. Paul and Barnabas disagreed, but they didn't allow this to take their eye off of God's call to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. They didn't let this, let it stop them. And too often, Christians, we, we let a disagreement stop us. We disagree on something, and so we're like, well, I'm going to take my toys and go home. Like, that's, that's not really the way that the Lord would have us to do it. Sure, there's times, there's times like this where they had to divide, but, but they kept their eye on the mission. Neither one of them decided to stay home and not go on a mission trip. Neither one of them said, you know what, I'm just, that just makes me so mad. I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to go around preaching the gospel anymore because, because of what Paul did or because of what Barnabas did. No, they, they didn't do that. And I've heard people say before, well, I used to go to church, but, but I don't go anymore because, because there's hypocrites there. Well, there are hypocrites at Anderson Hills. I'm sorry to inform you. All of us. All of us, right? Do any of us live this out perfectly every day of our lives? I don't. I, I don't want to mess it up. Don't get me wrong. It's not my goal. It's not an aspiration. But we all sin. The Bible's clear. We all fall short of God's glory, God's call. So when we sin, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And we strive to go forward and to grow in holiness, not to just live in hypocrisy, if you stay home because there's hypocrites, friend, then you're allowing people, you're allowing people to come in between your relationship with God. Did you come here to worship people or did you come here to worship God? Because we don't have a church to worship people. We have a church to worship God. And I get it. I get that human interactions can be painful and cause hurt. I understand. But I also believe that God is the great physician. And then he calls us to love, he calls us to forgive, he calls us to be a people of grace. Or sometimes I'll hear people say, well, I don't serve in ministry anymore because I did, but somebody ticked me off, so I decided to quit. Okay, well, there are humans serving in ministries as well, and sometimes they may tick you off. It, it could happen, in fact. In fact, you could tick somebody off. That may happen as well, right? But are we going to let our human disagreements hinder our ministries? I don't think that's God's call for us. And I understand there may be times that God calls you to a new area of ministry, kind of a Paul and Barnabas thing. Okay. But don't let it have you sit on the sidelines and just watch. Maybe for some of us, we, we sat, started sitting out a while back. That's, and we realize God's calling us to be in it. I think a beautiful picture of this is a choir, actually, right? I mean, you have a choir. I, choir, I doubt you've always agreed on everything all the time, always, right? Oh, they have. Never mind. Sorry. I stand corrected. But I'm sure there's been a disagreement. I'm sure if we started asking questions of the choir, there would be some disagreement. But they're here. Why? Because they have a common mission. They love the Lord, and they love singing about Him. They love leading us in worship, exalting God. I'm just guessing that in our choir that we have, say, Republicans and Democrats. I'm just guessing. I haven't surveyed, but I'm just guessing that to be true. I'm guessing we've got some, some Chevy people and some Ford people, right? Even some foreign car people, right? I'm guessing that's probably the case, right? I'm betting there's all sorts of things that they might divide on. 
but they're united in their love for Jesus and their love for singing about him. And I'm so glad they are. For if we only could sing with those who we agreed with fully, Danny, you're gonna have to schedule a lot of solos then. Because that's about how it'll be, right? <laughs> and we don't, I mean, we love sell those, but, but we want for us to be the body of Christ, like a choir is, united in mission, even though we may not always see eye to eye on things. Satan loves to use human disagreements to divide us. Church, we want to be different than that. We want to be different than that. We want to be united by something higher than that. Paul and Barnabas, they may have divided, but they didn't stop the ministry. They didn't stop the mission. They didn't stop the mission. Finally, number three, Christian unity is not the same as uniformity, meaning that unity does not mean we're always going to think alike on every single thing. We're going to have different ideas about a variety of things. And again, I'm not talking about things where the Bible is clear on as right and wrong. I'm talking about everything else in the world where there's, there's opportunity for disagreement. I love the fact that at Anderson Hills, we have a diversity of people here. We, we, we worship traditional. We worship modern. We worship at fresh expressions in, in care facilities and in assisted care facilities and in breweries. We have children and youth and, and, and older adults and everybody in between. I'm thankful for that. It's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. And we don't expect that we're going to agree on everything in life. That's okay. But you know that kind of mentality is different than the way that the world often operates today. The current climate is more win at all costs. You know, statistically, I read that very few churches that offer two styles of worship are growing. Isn't that interesting? It kind of surprised me because we are. I just think it makes sense, right? But so often when churches do this, they get at odds with one another. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. We want to be united. Even though we may appreciate different styles of worship, we want to be a church that's united. That's different than when at all costs. Think back years ago when we launched Modern. What if the folks here would have said, no way, it's going to be one style of worship here, right? There's so many people who have become Christians because we made that decision. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. And there's so many people becoming Christians because we decided to keep a strong traditional service. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. I don't buy the whole win at all cost stuff, all or nothing. Either agree or you're the enemy. I don't buy that, but it's the way our world is operating in many ways. It's almost like we've lost our appreciation for nuance, to really have deeper conversations, to actually hear what the other side thinks, to actually give it the opportunity to believe that maybe there's a good point to be had here. Maybe there's something, a counterbalance to what I think that I should learn about and, and understand. It's been said that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear and simple and wrong. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> for every complex problem, there's an answer that's clear, simple, and wrong. Our politicians want us to think this way, that these huge complex problems are oh so simple, and it's as clear that I am right and the other person is the devil. Very easy to understand. That's, that's not usually how it is. Christians should lead the way in understanding nuance, in appreciating people who disagree with them, still knowing why you believe what you believe, but appreciating other points of view as well. Christians should be leaders in this because we take the time to love, so we take the time to, uh, to understand, even when we don't agree. Now, you may have heard that there's an election coming up wanted you to be aware, okay? It's November, in fact. If you haven't registered to vote, seriously, go do it. Like, this is an important thing. People have died in this country so you can vote. You need to do that. That's very important. But, you know, I, I hear sometimes, I hear pastors say that you cannot be a Christian and vote for one candidate or the other. And the funny thing is, I hear pastors, some say it about this candidate and some say it about that candidate, and they're both quite convinced that you can't be a Christian and vote for the other person. But, friends, the Bible doesn't say that. Let's be real clear here. If, if you think 
that the Bible fully affirms your preferred candidate, you either don't know the Bible well or you don't know your preferred candidate well. Because I promise you that neither Trump nor Harris is the kingdom of God descending upon this earth. They are not. They are not. And I understand that if we're like most people, uh, most of you probably have in mind who you're going to vote for. You've, you've thought that I understand this, right? And, and that's fine. That's a good thing. We should be prayerfully considering. We should be studying God's word. We should be asking and we should be studying uh, the, the candidates, both their character and their policies, and say, who is it that I believe best represents my faith? Who is it that I believe? And I'm also going to understand there may be Christians who come down on the other side of it because there's some complicated issues here. And I may staunchly disagree with them, but I'm also going to love them. I'm going to treat them well. I'm not going to allow this to divide us as people. I'm not going to allow this to divide us as people. How you love people from, the, from a different point, political point of view may be more revealing than who you vote for. I say that again. How you love people who disagree with you may be more revealing about your relationship with Jesus than who you vote for. Friend, how you disagree matters. It matters so much. And I know for many of us, we hold strong political positions. That's why I'm not trying to talk you out of your positions. I'm asking you, to love others as the Lord calls you to love others and to always look at your own political position first through the lens of God's word and understand the ways that it aligns and the ways that it struggles to be aligned with God's word. Politics always has issues of corruption, pride, and sin. That's how it works. And don't misunderstand me. I'm so thankful to be an American. I'm so thankful I believe we have the best country in the history of the world. I believe we absolutely should vote and be engaged in politics. Don't misunderstand. But I also believe that politics are not our Lord. They're not our foundation. If your foundation is what you're seeing on the news all the time, it's time to reset your foundation. If your focus, if you're spending more time watching the news than you are in God's word, it's time to reset your priorities, friends. It's time to reset your priorities. For, for the, the issues of the day matter, but God's word is eternal. It is eternal. God's call is eternal. I heard a story from a pastor friend. This is not people here at Anderson Hills. But he had a couple of friends friends of his who began to have a, a, a political disagreement online. People have that sometimes, you know. And um, he saw he, one of them um, posted a link on Facebook about where you could go to pick up uh, signs advertising the Democratic candidate. And uh, this person uh, you know, was somebody who's a, a staunch Democrat, right, and, and posted things in favor of that. Another person, uh, another member of the same church saw this. This person is a, a strong Republican, right? And, of course, would not agree with that. Uh, And so uh, the Republican person commented, and their first comment, they said, say it ain't so. And the pastor took a deep breath thinking, oh, boy, here we go. My church is going to be divided once again over this. But then that same person said this, you know I love you. I'm so glad I can be on a different side and still enjoy who you are. I would do anything for you. You're the best. The other responded, I love you too. Now, clearly these are people who know each other, love each other, but what an awesome example. They disagree. They're going to continue to disagree. They're going to vote for different candidates. I'm quite confident based on what he said, but they disagreed in love. They disagreed in love. They set a good public example that you can disagree and still be kind to one another. You know, As Christians, we should be the best at this because we have the ultimate example, Jesus. He's the head of the church. The Bible often uses this metaphor for the church body. It says that we are the body of Christ and Jesus is the head. Colossians 1.17, 
Jesus Christ existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning. For any body to be united, it's all got to be listening to what the head says. We can't be out of sync with what the head says. That's not a healthy body. A.W. Tozer says this, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be if they were to become unity conscious and turn our, their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. I love that. That's so true. He's saying that we will be closer to one another if instead of saying we all need to think the same, so let's sit down and figure out how we can all agree on everything. Instead, if we say, Jesus, you are Lord. And I want my life to be lived for you. I want my life to be lived according to your standards and your call and your way. I want that for me because you are the Lord of my life. If each one of us are doing that, we're going to find ourselves, as we get closer and closer to Jesus, we get closer and closer to one another. It's like going up this triangle here, right, where our divisions seem less important. And like Paul and Barnabas, we may still disagree there may even be times where one of us is over here and one of us is over there. But we still keep growing closer to Jesus. We still remain faithful to his call because we know that his way is higher. His way is higher than the current political climate. His way is higher than an election. His way is higher than the things that we disagree upon because Jesus is Lord over all creation. He existed before anything else and he holds it all together. Friends, I'm gonna, I just I feel called just to take a little time and pray here because I think God may want to do some healing work in our lives. So let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Whether we are in this room today or whether we're watching online or watching at a later moment, I just pray that you would meet us right where we're at. And Lord, first of all, we want to come before you in humility. We confess, God, that there have been times where we've messed this up, every single one of us. Forgive me for the times where I'm not loving or caring in my, my ways of disagreeing. Forgive me for the times where I let my pride and arrogance get in the way. Forgive me for the times where I'm cantankerous or just not kind like you call. Forgive me for the times where I let a temporal disagreement separate me from people that I should be in relationship with. Forgive me for the times where I've left something not well. Thank you, God that for this and so many other things, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You are forgiven, my friends. God, I pray that you would make us one. As we say in our communion liturgy, would you make us one with you, Christ? One with one another as a church and one in ministry to all the world until you return and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Make us one, Lord. God, I thank you for the diversity of opinions in this room and in this church. I thank you for the diversity of experiences. I thank you for the fact that we can pray to the same God, read the same Bible, and sometimes even draw some different conclusions on non-essential things. Help us to be a people of grace, kindness, compassion, a people through whom the fruit of the Spirit 
just radiates, so visible. And Lord, I especially want to pray for those who perhaps have been hurt by rough disagreements. Some of us grew up in homes that weren't safe, or where conflict was not done well, but instead was done with 